are. Hi, families. Hello and good morning. Church, family, and guests. Uh, For those of you who might be streaming at home or who are new to the well, like Tyler said, my name is Sean Kelly, and I'm your new-ish family ministry leader, um, which means I have the distinct privilege of partnering with you in the discipleship of children, birth through high school, watch out, um, which, as you know, is a lot of work because the Lord has graciously given us lots and lots of children uh, and students, so praise his name. And now serving uh, you guys as a church, and apart from being a husband and father, uh, is one of the greatest joys of my life. I have taken this sermon from 35 down to 20 minutes, so we have a lot to go through today. Uh, But I just wanted to say we are in the middle of a series uh, called about gospel community called Life Together. Note the color today. Whoa, we're a family. It's colorful. It's diverse. Uh, I like that. Good ad. Uh, And that's what we believe gospel community here at The Well is, just doing life together around the gospel. So because uh, Jesus, the Son of God, lived a perfect life that we've all failed to live, and he died the death on the cross that we've all uh, deserved to die, and because he has been raised again to live forever with God, we can live too, uh, both now and forever. And the good news is we don't have to do it alone. Uh, Two weeks ago... Tyler talked about the design of community, how it was never God's plan to create or save a person, but a people uh, made in his image. And then last week, Logan walked us through just some of the benefits of community, um, that because of Christ, we too can be loved, uh, can be challenged, partnered with, accepted uh, by one another. That was out of order, if you're a note taker. Now... (laughs) I know um, this morning my hope is going to be that we would believe first and then from that belief live into the reality of community. And so the reality of community. And now I know that there are lots of realities, so maybe I should say a reality of community, but that would just drive me nuts that that didn't say the three times. So this is the reality of community. No. Now, I know that also that word is just kind of nebulous. Like, what does it mean, reality, or the realities we see in Scripture uh, that are true now and not true fully? Like, uh, the reality, perhaps, that we are declared uh, righteous by God, that we have right standing uh, with Him, but we're not yet wholly righteous in our words and thoughts and motivations and deeds yet. Uh, We're still a work in progress. We still sin. Or the reality that the kingdom of God uh, has already come. That there is nothing that Christ doesn't fully reign and rule over right now. Uh, But has not yet been completed or consummated in full, right? Christ has not yet returned. Sin and death and Satan, while defeated, uh, are here remaining. And here's a more personal example for me. I think you guys are going to like this because it comes with a confession. This is my new identity uh, right now. That's right. I can say it. I'm an Oklahoman, and I apologize, Texas family, if you're listening. Uh, No, I am proud to be here, uh, to be an Oklahoman, but I don't act in uh, function like I've been an Oklahoman my whole life, because I haven't. I've been in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Well, it's not a totally different world. I'm confused, because the street names are different. Um, So, over and over again, the scriptures call us to remember certain realities about who God is, and about who we are. Uh, in Christ, because they're true of us right now. Uh, They weren't always true of us. Uh, The dissonance today can be confusing, and we can take things for granted or just be forgetful. But as Martin Lloyd-Jones writes in his book, God's Ultimate Purpose, which, dope name for a book, uh, our greatest need is to become who we already are in Christ. Our greatest need is to become who we already are in Christ. So a spiritual reality this morning of who we already are as a community is that we are a family. Main point of today, no duh, we are a family. Uh, We're not just friends or acquaintances or individual people uh, who live in the same city or go to the same church uh, because the church is not just a building. As we like to say, well, kids, the church is God's family. So... Kids, if you, are, if you have a piece of paper, you'll notice you have this on your paper. Feel free to try and make a hexagon around it. It's pretty tricky. I got you on that. You know circles, you know squares, but hexagon, try it out. 
Well, for those of us who have put our faith, our faith, our faith in Christ, uh, the New Testament authors primarily say that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of a father, and indwelled by the same Holy Spirit, which literally just means he lives in us. He makes his home in us, plural. But why family this morning? Uh, well, A, because the elders told me to, and I said, okay. And two, uh, why is it important? Think about the image of family, perhaps, when there's others like a body or a priesthood or a nation, a temple. But maybe just think about it for a moment, just for yourselves. What comes to mind? What, uh, what emotions or pictures or feelings or relationships are evoked when you think of family? For me, in my immediate family right now, uh, this reality is extremely helpful uh, because we just left our family and church family in Texas uh, to move here. And it can be hard, you know, being new somewhere, especially during COVID, but knowing that wherever the Lord takes us, uh, we will always have a spiritual family uh, to belong to, uh, who will surround us and care for us, uh, is comforting. And it gives us permission uh, to be treated like family from y'all and to begin treating y'all like family right away. Hi, Quinn. I heard you. Hi, sweet girl. You and I may treat one another like family because we are. So thank you guys, by the way, caveat, for being our new spiritual family. We're grateful for you, and we welcome you guys in our lives. So enough of intro and what I have to say, because again, whew, the time crunch, here we go. Let's open up our Bibles back to Ephesians uh, 2, beginning in verse 11, and see what the Lord has to say by his spirit to help us believe and then become uh, the family we already are. So first point, if we believe we are a family in Christ, we need to remember uh, that once we were separated from God and from one another, once we were not a family. So to the church in Ephesus, Paul writes, he says, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hand, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ooh. It says, Gentiles, you were separated. You were not included. You were not yet aware of his promises. You were outside the family. And where's Paul going here? Why is he bringing up this past exclusion? Isn't the past the past, Paul? Come on. Uh, I think he's trying to increase, actually, their thankfulness uh, for the salvation they've already received. He says, remember... You had no hope because you were without God in the world. And I think it's interesting that that is the worst thing that Paul can think of, to be in the world but without God. Uh, because before Christ, isn't that all we ever really want? Uh, isn't that the separation we deserve uh, for our sin? Paul says that at that time you were separated from Christ, and he adds, separated from one another. Uh, look back at me in verse 11 at that name uh, that the Gentiles in that day were called by the Jews. And I think Paul brings this up to, sh to remind them of the enmity and the distance they once shared with each other. Uh, those called the circumcision, that is the Jews, called the Gentiles the uncircumcision. And since it's Family Worship Sunday, I'm going to leave some of those details for you guys to discuss in the car or at home. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> but in those days, the uncircumcision uh, was derogatory uh, and stemmed from a total racial and superiority complex uh, that God's people had. It was how they, who were supposed to bring a blessing to all nations, called those lesser nations uh, the not chosen, the not special, uh, the not saved. Man. And I think it's just evil when we look inside and can be aware that we who receive uh, the free gift of God's compassion and mercy in Christ can then look at other people in our same previous state of spiritual need and then begin to feel or act superior. Uh, like we did, or, are, or, or worse, that we are uh, something that added to our salvation. But see Paul's briefly and similarly frustrated slash dismissive comment with, ah, it's just made in the flesh by hands, instead of their circumcision being made in the heart uh, by God. I think he's showing us this, brothers and sisters, because it's going to be really hard to see and treat one another as family um, if we are either more content uh, with old, visible, earthly things that we used to worship before Christ, 
uh, or if we currently exalt or elevate or prioritize ourselves above one another. I think that can be a real stumbling block to our family ethos today. So if we are a family in Christ and we believe that we were once separated uh, from God and one another, a, a way that we can now, through the Spirit's help, become uh, the family that we are is to repent of any remaining superiority uh, and to embrace humility and thankfulness together. So obviously, entrance into this family requires humility uh, when, by grace, we can acknowledge that we have elevated ourselves above God. And when we repent of our sins, we submit to God and cling to Christ. Uh, but here, Paul is saying that your pride also can prevent us today from faithful participation in the family. When we start perhaps clinging to our preferences so tightly, uh, or start feeling upset, God, that these people aren't the people I would otherwise choose or we start pulling away from one another because of how needy or immature or untheologically refined that brother or sister is, uh, we just need to be thankful that we have been included in this family at all. Amen. So let me ask you guys just some, just some thoughtful questions. Do you see yourself as someone in need of grace, uh, in need of care, uh, in need of a family? Or are there any subtle suggestions forming in you Uh, that you're not like other people, that you're okay. You'll be all right on your own. Because if so, we need to repent of any remaining pride or superiority and embrace humility and thankfulness together. Now, thank you, Jesus, our good older brother. He didn't leave us in that hopeless state, and he doesn't today. If we believe that we were separated from God and one another, we also believe then that Christ reconciled us, bringing peace as we just read. And it's a long text, but I'm going to read it again real quick because it's God's word. So even if that's all you heard today, that would be a sufficient sermon. <laughs> but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came, praise God, he came and he preached peace to you, and to you and you and you and you uh, who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, uh, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Ooh, there's so much here. But I like this um, imagery that he uses about hostility. He says, uh, where there was hostility between us and God and us and one another, Jesus didn't just take it away. He killed it uh, by being killed on the cross himself. That shalom, that peace that was lost in the garden, where everything is whole and right and together uh, under the perfect rule of God, uh, that family now is restored through Jesus Because Jesus didn't just make peace for us. Jesus is our peace in person. Um, By living the perfect life and abolishing the law of commandments by obeying them all to a T. And then through the cross, reconciling us both, Jew and Gentile, single and married, kids or no kids, male or female, black or white, American, non-American, reconciling us both to God in one body. And then through the cross and through his blood, he preaches peace to you and me. And if we have responded to that preaching with love and trust towards Jesus, regardless of our differences, this is where you and I are right now. If you show that visual, you and I are in this uh, circle in the bottom right. Our union with God in Christ means that we are no, that no other circle can set us apart more than this one. And that we have been invited into a family together, into God's own divine family. So therefore, if we are to become that family in Christ, and Christ has indeed reconciled us to one another, making peace, we must also therefore repent of any divisiveness to embrace unity and peace. I know that's a a big word floating around right now, but 
This is also why it's so good for us to do life together as a church family, all of us, uh, why we should not ignore uh, but pursue a diversity of all kinds and where our gentleness and peaceableness and love for one another should stem from this bond of peace. And it is good that we have our differences. It is intentional. We'll never stop being engendered or racial. Uh, and it's good that we have our own biological or adoptive families, but we should never uh, obviously let them hold us back from caring for the needs of our spiritual family when we actually, with each other, share stronger bonds in the blood of Christ. And it's good uh, that we all have different personalities and interests uh, and skills, but they should never cause in our body clickishness or exclusiveness or subdivisions in Christ. And it's good, I love this, we have brains with different thoughts about the best, most biblical way uh, to love God and neighbor in our churches, in our homes, in our society, through politics. Uh, we should never let those disagreements dig us into the divisive hole of unpeacefulness. Uh, families are no strangers to conflict or fights. Uh, some people are like, amen! <laughs> And we should fight to uphold best Christian practice in light of our shared beliefs. But we should also fight to be at peace with one another with all gentleness and humility and openness to reason. For how we fight together will ultimately show the world whether we belong to a family or not. So let me ask you. Question number two. Round two. Here we go. Have you fought for any camaraderie or desire to be at peace with your brothers and sisters with whom you're in conflict, uh, as far as it depends on you? And are there any subdivisions of your identity you might be holding up or holding on to too tightly that are pushing away that other bond you share with your Christian brothers and sisters? Is there anywhere your theology of Christian unity is accidentally uh, or intentionally becoming uniformity? Um, we are not uniform. We are diverse, but together. And Christ has reconciled us, bringing peace. So we should repent of our divisiveness to embrace peace and unity. There's a lot here. But let's keep going. Last part. Finally, to help us believe we are a family in Christ, we didn't look much further than the word of God in verse 19. For if once we were separated from God and from one another, then Christ reconciled us, bringing peace. Now we are fellow members of the household of God. Verse 19, so then, because of all these things, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Mm. Since the reconciling work of Jesus has closed the gap that once stood between us and God and us and each other, we are no longer strangers, I love that, but fellow citizens of his kingdom fellow members of the household of God. And who else lives in God's household than his children with him? Galatians 4, uh, 4 to 6 will say that when the fullness of time had come, uh, God sent forth his son to be born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those uh, who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. If you're a lady, as sons and daughters. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son in our, our hearts Crying, Abba, Father, this is true. This is true of who we are now. And another scripture that literally blew my mind this week that I just don't remember seeing or ever dwelling upon was John 20, verse 17. Uh, one of the very first things Jesus says after he is resurrected and Mary hugs him after recognizing him. Jesus says, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Uh, but go, go to my brothers and say to them, guess what? Guess what? I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. To my God and your God. Crazy! One of the very first things out of his mouth is that I've done it, we are a family, and this is what they need to hear right now. So then, if we truly believe uh, and are fellow members of the household of God, and <laughs> this next point is going to be ironic because Jesus basically said, don't hug me, uh, we must repent of our estrangement and to embrace one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, so we ought not to be a stranger to Jesus, know him and embrace him uh, through faith and don't be a stranger to one another. Embracing one another will look like welcoming one another, expecting one another, and loving one another in everyday life. And next week's sermon is going to be on love, the main response of our unity together. But just let me ask you real quick, 
How available are you guys for uh, each other in your church family? How often do you see each other, know each other like family? Do you invite um, your church family to pray with you when things are difficult or to counsel you when things are complex? Do you eat around the table and just have fun together? I like board games. Sometimes they go really late. It was really fun. And if one of your brothers or sisters was about to do something really foolish, would you feel that sense of shared responsibility to talk with that brother or sister? Uh, Because last week... Sorry. Last week, I had a conversation with uh, with my biological sister about something I was concerned about. She invited prayer and feedback, and I offered that prayer and feedback, and we discussed the scriptures and her heart together. But while uh, the content was difficult and awkward and undesirable, uncomfortable, the reflex to talk to her was totally natural. She's my sister, and she's my sister in Christ. And we've done this before, and I have an obligation to her and her to me. But man, I love my sister, and even though she ultimately ended up making a decision, I'm not super convinced was good. Uh, And I may not always like what she does. Uh, I'll always love her. And I hope that we together, as brothers and sisters, might do the same. So if we are fellow members of the household of God, then we must repent of our estrangement to one another, uh, to embrace one another often as brothers and sisters. We should be committed to one another, in affection, uh, in accountability, and in our available presence. So, we're out of time, but what is the most challenging thing for you to believe this morning or uh, that the Lord is just pricking you to become? Uh, Is it that, maybe, that sin does actually separate you from God and from one another still? Or that um, so the seemingly impossible reality really has happened, that Christ has reconciled us, no matter how different or unpeaceable we are sometimes together. Because that is true. Or are you having trouble envisioning or embracing the reality that uh, the true Christians in this world and in this room are your family? And I thank um, our Father for this new reality through His Holy Spirit. Uh, And I trust that he will help us believe that we are a family and become who we already are more and more. Well, church, even though I'm still getting to know you, just wanted to say that I love you. And um, I'm committed to serving you guys here. And I hope you will serve me and my family as well. And as we all grow in humble thankfulness, in a unified peacefulness, and in the bonds of fraternal uh, love, uh, stay tuned and Come back next week as we talk about what it means to love one another. And until then, don't be a stranger. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the life in this room, both physically and spiritually. I love seeing families and children and singles and different peoples from all over walks of life and all over the world. Thank you that you have made us uh, something truly unique. Thank you that who we are... Uh, puts your divine life on display. And thank you. Uh, God, I just ask for your help. Ask for your help in identifying these. I don't know why, Spirit, uh, you led me to such a personal investigation of our own hearts this morning, but yeah, I just pray that you'd root it up. I pray that you would root up anything that helps us not see this reality as true or not act like this is true because our heart is deep waters and it is confusing. And I thank you that you have given us each other. It is not good uh, for us to be alone. Thank you for brothers and sisters who've prayed for me in preparation for this sermon, who've coached me, who have been patient with me. Thank you for my wife, who is my sister in Christ and her care. I pray that you would bring the children who are bouncing and rocking and coloring in this room to your family. I pray that you would include them and your blood would preach to them and to them and to them and to you and to you. And Father, that through faith and the perfect work of Jesus and his atoning death, God, would you fill the earth with your family? Would we be who you always wanted us to be? And would you help us be who we already are? We desperately need you. And we want, uh, we want this. We're grateful for your word. Thank you that it's sufficient and powerful. That it doesn't return void. 
Thank you for our good brother, Paul. Thank you for Paul. Even as he writes to the brothers and sisters in Ephesus that we get to spend eternity with. We get to spend eternity with Paul if we love and trust in Jesus. So thank you for our big family. Help us where maybe our current experience of our own broken families is a hindrance, a hurt, not a help. Help us to participate well in both. We love you, God. We want to be more like you. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, guys.